Our scripture lesson comes from the Hebrew scriptures. It is a lectionary text for this Sunday, and it comes to us from the opening chapters of the book of Ruth. Hear now God's word. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and their two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died so that the woman was left with her two sons, without her two sons or her husband. Then Naomi started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had consideration for his people in Bethlehem and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, And they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back. Each of you go to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept, Aloud, they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back. Daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, Would you then wait until they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In life and in death, we belong to you, loving God. By the power of your spirit and the promise of your resurrection in Christ, you draw near to us. You are with us always. And so we pray that you will open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to you, to your word for us now, to the strength and comfort that you alone can offer, and to the gift of this community into which you have called us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is something about the company we keep. Whether we believe, as Calvin did, that God calls us together for a purpose— or whether we struggle to find meaning in the connections that mark our daily lives, we can agree that whether we like it or not, we are impacted by those with whom we spend our time. 
with that person who takes up too much space in the grocery line, you know, like spreading out their groceries so you can't get yours on the belt, with a child who waves hello out the car window. Side note, my son did this on Friday. He said, Mom, roll your window down. I did. And he saw a woman at the bus stop, and he said, Hi, and a friendship was born. We are impacted by the stranger that holds that elevator door for us as we are rushing to our next destination. As a people of faith, we are reminded that we are secured by the hands that sew stitches into magi robes and shepherd nervous sheep across the pageant stage. We are strengthened by those voices who speak truth into verse and teach us to do the same, or those who make art accessible to all, whether those who are in a juvenile detention center or simply by taping art in zigzag patterns along church walls. We are warmed by the embrace of a generous spirit who stops by after the postlude to wish us well before heading for a cup of tea. We matter. We rub off on each other. We are formed and informed by those with whom we spend our time. We adopt their mannerisms and sometimes their beliefs. We learn their recipes. We are happy when they win because we've been cheering them on. We mark their birthdays on our calendars because they have become a part of us and a part of our daily lives. In today's lesson, we hear a story of an aging widow whose destiny is directly impacted by the company she keeps. Naomi, we hear, is traveling to her native place of Bethlehem. And along the journey, she releases her daughter-in-laws, who are Moabites, widows themselves, to return home to their mother's houses to their families of origin, because it's here, Naomi knows, that they will find security and comfort and perhaps even a future. Naomi can provide none of these herself. Having lost her husband and both of her sons, Naomi lets go of the two members of her immediate family that she has left. She is resigned. She is cursed, she will later say. God has dealt bitterly with her. But she wants to spare these women, that she, these women that she now loves as her daughters and let them have a chance that she knows she cannot give them. And so she sets them free. But Ruth stays. She clings to Naomi. She holds on and will not let go. And she vows to Naomi that she is going to go with her. She's going to make a home wherever she is. She's going to worship her God. She is going to be buried alongside her. She entangles her fate in Naomi's future and refuses to leave her alone in the world as a childless widow with no hope. And so Naomi realizes that Ruth is maybe more stubborn than she herself is, or at least she has a burst of energy left for the fight. And she lets Ruth come along, and off they go to Bethlehem. Now, I have confessed a tendency I have to all of you before, and I name it here again. I like to read the end of the story. Sometimes I like to skip ahead and know how things will work out before I even start the first page. So we're going to do that today for those of you who have a tendency like me to read ahead in the story or to spend some time in scripture. We are going to remind one another of how the story goes. Because in Bethlehem, Ruth and Naomi find more than daily bread gleaned from the grain on the outskirts of Boaz's field. Ruth marries Naomi's kinsman redeemer, Boaz. They have a child. And as the story continues, we learn that it is through this line 
through Ruth and Boaz that David's line continues. It's through this line that God took on flesh in Christ Jesus. A commentator says this, In this reading, theology is hidden and subtle. God does not break into the world in miracles that overturn nature or bring dead loved ones back to life. But instead, God acts through Ruth and her unquestioning fidelity to Naomi. This means that the stranger, widow, and enemy becomes the unexpected model of loyalty and devotion. In this story, the loyalty and devotion of the stranger, Ruth, the Moabite, will save the line of David. The outsider keeps the nation from extinction, saves the people, ends barrenness, and gives life to a dying seed. We see in this story, much like the story of Job, that God restores the futures of those who have suffered. God brings hope from despair. God brings even new life out of death. And here we too can find hope in the reminder that our stories continue even after suffering extreme loss. We can take heart that even when we suffer an unspeakable tragedy, God opens and writes a new chapter. Our faith offers us this assurance. And it can comfort us when we find ourselves like Naomi at a crossroads created by loss and grief and the instability that loss creates. God can take the hardest stuff of human living and create something new and even beautiful. God reminds us over and over and over again that we are not abandoned in this difficulty. We are not left alone in confusion or grief, but God, who took on flesh and dwelt among us, is with us in solidarity. And the same God who made us continues to create within us and through us and through the stuff our lives dishes out so that there's new life. But let's not jump too fast to the easier stuff. Our text has us on the road with Naomi and Ruth, and we stand with them in the midst of grief. We face with them the weight of a future without the ones they love, without those whose presence kept them safe. We stand with them in the face of limited possibilities, of societal injustice, of vulnerability, and we join them in feeling the helplessness of not knowing what comes next. And we see in Ruth's poem, not simply vows of faithful love so beautiful they are often enfolded into wedding liturgies, but we see the willingness of one who's going to stick around when things are tough. We see the dedication of a daughter who is willing to stand with Naomi in her most raw pain and say, guess what? I am not going anywhere. I'll never forget walking into an intensive care unit to visit a longtime congregant as she made her slow journey to her heavenly home. On the first day I visited, I was surprised to see one of our congregants who recently passed sitting quietly on the couch in the room, reading, praying, keeping vigil. Her husband had dropped her off earlier that day, so, and she would stay until the congregant's son arrived um, after work that day. I told her how much I appreciated her care of her friend, and she shook her head and said, this is just what we do. This is what we do. This is how we take care of each other. We show up. We do not leave when it gets difficult. We watch over each other. We keep vigils. We hold hands. We pray. We embrace, we let others know how much we love them. Ruth 
has a lot to show us about how to hold the hard stuff. She shows us a willingness to be uncomfortable and even vulnerable so that another person is loved well. Her ability to stand in solidarity with Naomi in her loss and vulnerability, it enacts justice. It extends comfort. And it creates a gateway to new possibility, not only for Naomi or for Ruth, but for all who come after. Her steadfast love and refusal to leave is a radical act of love. It models the solidarity and connection that God in Christ modeled and offered to us. And so today, as we worship, we honor these connections, holding the tradition of Reformation Sunday, as we also hold in our hearts and in our minds those who formed the faith upon which we stand, and commemorate on this All Saints Day those from our family of faith and our families of origin and our neighborhoods, those who have died since we last gathered together in November of 2019. A lot has happened since then. An election, twin pandemics of COVID and racism a lot has happened, and we acknowledge that as we have been doing this fall, that babies have been born, youth and their cats have been confirmed on Zoom, couples have been married. We've learned to recognize smiles on one another's faces through dancing eyes above our mask. A lot has happened to us, too. We haven't been able to check on each other in quite the same way as we once did. We haven't been able to watch someone progress after surgery week after week, or to notice how someone is navigating an empty nest for the first time. For the most part, we are not too sure of exactly how tall one another's kids have grown. And some of us from our congregation have even moved to new homes in new states, and while virtual worship has allowed us to praise God together in community, we never got to hug goodbye. We've lost a lot this past year. Let's face it, it hasn't been easy, and even though I am so grateful to be looking at each of you and your masked faces here in the sanctuary, and I am grateful that I am preaching to a congregation in person as well as a virtual congregation rather than my own image in a monitor. I wonder when I'm going to sit on those steps again and be surrounded by kids, including my own. I wonder when we are going to take our good old time to share God's peace with one another so much so that the liturgists need to kind of call us to order at the beginning of the servant say, okay, people, come on, we have to get moving. Let us join together in the call to worship. And there is the poignant reality that we have lost those we love so deeply this season. There are many whose regular pews I can point out, but I cannot even remember the last time I got to embrace them because the circumstances of the last couple years have kept things sort of fuzzy like that. But we lost two of the oldest mem members of our church family in this season, Lois and Dorothy, vibrant women whose wisdom and kindness never failed. We lost educators and artists and politicians and parents and judges and janitors. We've lost those who were generations deep in the life of our church, including a grandchild of a former pastor. We lost those who have been a part of our congregational family for just a few years. 
We've lost those whose service to our larger community and our presbytery is noteworthy. And we've lost those who simply made us feel like a million bucks with a gentle smile, a question about our vacation, the gift of a book, or a word of encouragement. And most of us have suffered losses outside of ELPC, where we have had to navigate the impossible decisions about how we can best say goodbye in the midst of a pandemic. And so for just a moment, we join Ruth and Naomi at this place. We stand together at a crossroads between what was and what will be, and we name what is. We notice who is missing. We say the truth that life is not the same without them. We feel the dis-ease of their absence, even as we know that we need to figure out how to go on and that we will. And we do what we hadn't been able to do for months. We cling to one another. We weep and we mourn. We hold each other's grief. And then we move forward together. Together, we dare to give thanks as a people of faith and as an act of radical faith and hope and love. We celebrate how we have been changed by those who have accompanied us along our journey. We give thanks that by God's grace, we were blessed enough to know Lee and Justin and Buzz and Nancy and David and all of the saints whose images are on this table and all of the saints lifted in our bulletin and all of the saints we carry in our hearts. We praise God that we got to learn how to be more faithful and just and compassionate and curious and hopeful and creative because we don't have to journey through lives alone, but we have each other. And even when some of us are missing, we have the us who is gathered here. We are one another's companions on the journey, formed by and with one another by God's grace and sometimes by the Spirit's humor. We move forward carrying our loved ones with us together. Their stories and their figures of speech, their hobbies and their smell, the songs that remind us of them and the lessons we learned and we embrace, and if we're not ready to hug, not even with vaccines and masks, we can do the air hug thing. We can send a Grubhub gift card. We can write a note about a favorite memory. And we together remember, and we together remind each other of the truth of the gospel, the truth we tell our son when he misses his grandpa. Love never dies. And so we travel together, not walking away from those we've lost, but into a future that is both shaped by their memory and by God's grace. We step forward with a reminder of our faith that our lives are situated together within the chronicles of God's eternal story. And that God can take the hardest stuff of our lives too and make a new and beautiful future. And so today, even in our grief, may we give thanks together for the ways in which the love of others have changed us, for the ways that we are formed and continually being reformed in relationship to one another and to God. And may we give thanks for the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that removes the sting of death and reminding us that God's not done yet. And for this, saints, may we say thanks be to God. Amen.